WatchArts is the world's leading secondary watch market research platform. Dive into the data yourself at watcharts.com. The GMT Master from Rolex is one of those watches about which it feels like there is literally nothing left to say. It's a Rolex. It's from their professional family. It tells the time and displays the date. It can also display the time in up to two additional time zones. It looks very nice, and Rolex has been making them since the 1950s. So um, even in the modern era, there are very many different ones to choose from. How do you get the best value for money if you're thinking about buying one in the secondary market? We'll look at some considerations and propose some picks, explain our reasoning, and share some market data and active listings. And as always, we welcome you to check out the listings and the rest of the data for yourself at watchcharts.com. We'll start off, however, with just explaining what the GMT Master is as a watch. And if you don't want to listen to this section because you already know what this watch is, um, you can always just skip ahead to the next section, but we'll just kind of quickly talk about what the watch is first. So uh, there's a lot going on here for somebody who's only looking at it for the first time. So we'll run through the basics. The first thing I'll point out is the local hour hand, which is read on a 12 hour scale, like a normal watch and is adjustable backwards and forwards in one hour increments without stopping the watch or sort of adjusting the home hour hand, which I'll get to in a second. But basically this is your local time uh, wherever you are um, the hour indication for that. Um, and then the minutes, of course, will always just indicate the minutes for wherever you are. Then the next thing I'll point out is the date, which can also be adjusted forwards or backwards um, and is tied to the local hour hand. So as you sort of wind it forward, the dates will start incrementing. So in this case, for instance, let's say it's 10 a.m., you know, you would cycle through past noon once, and then you'd come back and, you know, sort of increment the local hour hand another 12 times. And then when it crossed 12 the second time, the date would automatically switch to 29. And then you could do the same thing sort of going backwards in just, you know, going back 10 hours, you would hit 27. So that's tied to the local hour hand, which, as I said, is jump, you know, is in, it can jump sort of independently without having to stop the watch um, from running uh, both forwards and backwards. Then you have your home hour time, uh, which is read on a 24 hour scale with 12 o'clock as midnight. So if you look at the outer scale on the bezel, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail on that scale, the home hour hand is currently pointed at uh, 10, which is also what the time says on this watch. So in this case, the local hour and the home hour both read the same. And then what you'll also see is that the bezel has two different colors. There's the hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., which because they're daylight, in contrast to the remaining 12 hours, they're sort of um, displayed using a, uh, a lighter color to basically indicate or to basically contrast against the, the hours of the day when, generally speaking, you don't get sunlight. And then lastly, that bezel itself is movable in either direction and displays a full sort of 24 hours. And what you can do now is basically tell up to three time zones by um, using your local hour uh, for the first time zone. The second time zone is told by the home hour hand. And then if you rotate the bezel in either direction to get an offset, you'll basically be able to read off of a, a third time zone on that external bezel. Um, the version that's shown here specifically is the reference 126710BLNR. It's got a 40 millimeter case, case in steel on a Jubilee bracelet, also in steel, 100 meters of water resistance, the 3285 movement with 70 hours of power reserve. It's only 12 and a half millimeters thick. The bracelet comes with an easy link extension. This one as configured and as shown retails for $10,900. This is as far as the genre of the GMT watch is concerned, as close as you can get to perfection. There is nothing extraneous and there is nothing that you would consider necessary, but that is missing here. In my personal opinion, for my tastes, I think um, it would um, sort of, you know, become even a little bit, that little bit extra easier to, to use if the internal rehote on this watch also had a 24 hour 
scale, um, again, sort of color coded for the day and, uh, and nighttime hours, which just makes tracking that third time zone just that little bit easier. And there are um, GMT watches from other brands um, that do do this in parts. Of course, it's arguable that, you know, those watches are better because they have other perhaps even more serious shortcomings. But, you know, the uh, the Seiko SKX GMTs and the Norcane Adventure GMTs are two in particular that come to mind. So in summation, it's a great sort of go anywhere, do everything, you know, complicated watch. Um, it's one of the, you know, progenitors of its genre of travel watches, broadly speaking. So in terms of all of the things that enthusiasts generally tend to care about when it comes to buying and owning a, a luxury watch, it does all of the things that you would want it to. But, you know, how does it how is it done on the market? And if you were to try and go um, figure out sort of where it's placed in the market relative to other watches and what you should be paying for one if you're thinking about getting one, um, you know, what are, what are the answers to some of those questions? So we'll sort of start off that discussion by just looking at the comparison between the GMT Master 2 index and the Rolex brand index um, on watchcharts.com. So what we have uh, in addition to the brand indexes is the ability to see, you know, indexes for um, collection level instead of just at the brand level. So the GMT Master 2 index has the 27 models for Rolex, the 27 references that we recognize, um, and it includes all of them. So there's um, five of them that are over 27, uh, th there are five of them that are over $100,000 each. Um, of the 27, six are gem set, six are precious metal, four are two tone, and then 11 are steel. And you know all of the ones that we recognize basically are, are in that index. Um, the Rolex brand index, on the other hand, is a 30 most popularly traded references by transaction value um, of a total of uh, 555 references for Rolex, the brand as a whole that we recognize. Um, only six of the references in that index are, are actually GMT masters. And you know there's only one that's over 100,000, None of them are gem set, uh, and uh, you know, 18 of these are in steel. So uh, it felt necessary to sort of go over what the differences are in the composition because that explains to some degree the differences that you see in the long-term trend um, on this chart. So what these what the chart shows is a comparison chart again of the growth over the last three years of those two uh, indexes. And uh, what's interesting to see here is that even though both follow that trend of sort of appreciation and then you know hitting sort of like a, a hockey stick kind of growth almost hitting a peak and then being in a decline since then and maybe starting to stabilize somewhat now uh, in the past uh, two to three months as we've discussed somewhat previously as well. Even though the even though that that's what the the long term sort of trend has been like, there are some differences. The peak that the GMT Master family experienced as a whole, for example, was not as high as the peak that uh, the brand as a whole experienced. So, you know, starting off from uh, you know the three year ago sort of starting point in um, April 2020, the peak for the market uh, for Rolex, um, you know, was around 85 percent, whereas the GMT Master family only uh, appreciated around 70%. And then the last sort of thing that's interesting to mention here is that even though it's experienced this rise and then this fall, um, overall value retention, which is um, you know not something that's necessarily tracked for all of the watches in this uh, index because there are 27 uh, references and not all of them are in production, but for the ones that are in production and which have a valid current retail price for which we can calculate um, value retention, uh, as of two months ago, which is the last time we did this analysis, the GMT Master retains more of its value in you know across all of the references that are that were in production as of two months ago than any other model family from from Rolex. So um, even though they sort of like saw this rise and then this fall, um, you know value retention as a whole still sort of like every single one of these watches you know is trading above retail. Um, and if you want to think about it sort of you know using an analogy, then in absolute terms, you know prices the secondary market prices for these watches may have fallen down from Mount Everest levels to like Denali levels, but you're still like 20,000 feet above sea level. 
So what we'll do next is just run through, uh, you know, a bunch of different references um, from the modern era and um, pick out what we think is a great sort of affordable pick, um, then, uh, you know, a great non-ceramic pick, and then, um, you know, sort of uh, share my personal pick. So the way that we're going to uh, break down the data for this view is talk about the reference, uh, the metal in which the watch was produced, um, the years in which it was in production, the current retail price, if it's uh, currently in production, uh, the market price as of the end of April 2023, the market price range, uh, which is basically the, the band um, one standard deviation above and below the market price. Uh, the delta for the market price from one year ago, the volatility, which again is a measure of how spread out um, the sales for any given watch tend to be from one another. And then value retention is going to be just a measure of how well for the watches that are in production, uh, they're holding their value on the secondary market relative to their prices at retail. So that's a lot of information. And so what I'll do is I'll add in a few rows at a time. And so the first section we'll look at is watches that are under the $20,000 price point on the uh, on the secondary market. So uh, what you'll see here is a couple of uh, neo vintage references or somewhat, you know, they're, they're sort of creeping into vintage territory. Um, and then a bunch of six digit references, um, including the first one um, to feature a ceramic bezel. And you know, most of these are not in production anymore. The 126710 BLNR Batman is uh, on a on an Oyster bracelet. It's 10,700 on a Jubilee bracelet that costs $200 more. That's $10,900. Uh, the market price for this uh, is $17,200. So that means a, vol a value retention right now of 61%. So that's uh, its market value is 61% over its uh, retail price. Uh, then we add on a few more references in the twenty to forty thousand dollar range, and you start seeing, um, you know, some of the references that are still sort of hyped, as well as um, you know, starting to see um, two tone and precious metal references, and then sort of you know you finish up the table with a bunch of other um, precious metal references, and then right at the bottom the new references one two six seven one three and one, two, six, seven, one, eight, which are going to be two-tone and yellow gold respectively. So the one, two, six, seven, one, three, two-tone um, is sort of like a, an updated version of the first row in the table, which is a one, six, seven, one, three. And then the one, two, six, seven, one, eight is sort of a revival of other references that are um, you know, not included in this in this view. This is obviously not meant to be an exhaustive view of all of the references that have ever been produced. For example, there are no gem side references here. And then, uh, you know, even uh, for the five digit, there's only just two that I sort of included. So this is by no means intended to be an exhaustive view, but it is meant to be a broadly representative view of certainly the most popular GMT master references. So if we were to pick something that is quote unquote affordable, you know, given uh, what you can see here for the market price range, um, again, I, there is something quite amusing about talking about uh, uh, something that costs more than $10,000 as being quote unquote affordable, but we are talking about luxury watches. So yeah, if we were to make a pick for an affordable or best value for money sort of, uh, you know, candidate from this list, uh, my submission would be the reference 116710LN, uh, which features a fully black bidirectional bezel. It was the first um, modern six-digit Rolex to feature a ceramic bezel. Uh, came in steel, produced from 2013 to 2019, has a current market price of $13,000. And it's down over the last year, but you know not as much as uh, a lot of the newer references. And the volatility on the price on this is is not too great. So that means like you're, you're starting to see some variation in prices, but not to the degree that you might if you look at something that's over... 10 years old. These watches are at most 10 years old. The price history chart for this watch um, over the last five years shows that um, basically once it got discontinued um, around 2019, prices sort of, you know, kind of crept up. And then um, following the rest of the market, there was a spike up. And then since then, prices have come back down and they've sort of settled to uh, where they used to be around the mid 2021 level. So long-term value has appreciated the hype 
um, around, you know, sort of luxury sports watches, steel sports watches. Didn't affect this one as much as uh, many of the others. And they today still trade above retail for the current version of the same watch. Um, and what you get for that money is, and what, what really makes it great value for money is you get a lot of the same things that you would if you wanted to buy a modern version of this watch for what could be the least amount of money out of all of the available options. Um, you get a steel uh, on an oyster bracelet, you know, execution of the design. Uh, the ceramic bezel is first off, it's, 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 a, it's ceramic. So it is certainly, you know, of the modern era and comes with all of the benefits that ceramic provides, but it is unicolor. So maybe that's a deal breaker for you. From a design standpoint, the GMT hand and the text for GMT Master 2 are the only two sort of design elements on the watch that are not done in black or white. Um, they're done in Rolex green. And so it has a very sort of understated look um, from a design standpoint. And then of course, it has a modern movement that is at most 10 years old at this point and could be as young as four years old. So from a longevity standpoint or uh, having to worry about service standpoint, um, you know, th those concerns really would not exist with with this watch. So really you're getting all of the things that you would want out of a modern GMT Master um, without necessarily having to, uh, you know, pay a premium for the hype. So um, here's a listing for one that um, just came up on Reddit, uh, posted by somebody who has a decent amount of positive feedback and uh, is listed for $13,500 with a complete set with box and papers for one from 2018. So that's closer to the tail end of its production run, but it's a complete set and the you know list price is $13,500. So for that much money, which is which is still over, you know, the retail price, of course, for a modern GMT Master II, if you can get one at retail, and you had to pick between that experience and buying this, then of course I would say get the modern one because, you know, it, it's it's modern, it's new, it's got your name on the box, uh, and the and the papers, and um, you know it'll come to you scratch free, and and all of the memories that'll get written for this watch will be sort of yours, um, and you <laughs> won't have shared them with anyone else um, for as long as you own the watch. Those are some of the considerations that I, I imagine would would go through anyone's mind um, trying to pick and choose between just this and and a modern GMT. But we'll move on from that and actually think about not just the sort of the affordable um, sort of, you know, what is the most bang for your buck sort of way of um, maximizing your experience, but also expanding that a little bit and saying, what happens if we go a little bit farther back in time and look at references from the 90s and the, uh, the first decade of the 21st century? And so there's, you know, two references here that um, we've included for this uh, analysis. They are the 16710 and the 16713. The 16710, of course, comes with both the Pepsi and the Coke, um, and then also the just the fully black um, bezels. They both have market prices around um, twelve to $13,000, and they both have, um, you know, some of the highest volatility of any of the watches on this list. And the reason for that is that um, listings for this uh, set of references can go as far back as the 1980s. And so for watches that stopped being in production, you know, maybe 15, over 15 years ago, these watches are going to be in all sorts of condition having been out there for as long as they have. So depending on whether or not it's complete, if it's been polished, uh, and when I say complete, I mean if it comes with box and papers, if it's been polished, if it's been serviced, if it's uh, seen any sort of damage, if the case and bracelet are just sort of, um, you know, destroyed out of all recognition just because of how heavily the watch has been used. Like all of those things will sort of, you know, dictate a wide range of values. So for the purposes of um, this analysis, I pulled out a representative listing for the 16713, which between these two references is the one that I am personally partial to because I'm just a sucker for the steel and um, yellow gold two-tone look from Rolex, especially when paired with the gold bezel and the black bezel insert and the black dial. 
my ideal preference would be for a Jubilee bracelet, but this particular uh, listing is for uh, this watch on an Oyster bracelet listed for $12,595 from uh, you know, a reputable seller on, on Rolex forums. And this really is going to give you, you know, for, for that much money, uh, really sort of uh, all of the things from a GMT master wearing experience that we've already covered, but also it's an older generation of case. Um, it's got bevels on the, you know, on the, on the lugs. The case itself is just thinner. It's, it, you know, it flows a little bit more. It's not, it's not got that sort of um, muscular chunky look that the maxi cases of the modern generation have. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's going to look and wear slightly differently on the wrist. And so if that's a look in particular that you are partial to, then this is another sort of excellent pick in that, uh, in that vein. But of course, like I said, because there is as much variation as there is, um, you're going to want to decide if you want to dive down that particular rabbit hole to, you know, look for one that matches your exact sort of preferences. So like I said, for me, I would want it to be on the uh, on the Jubilee bracelet, but then I also want the drilled lugs and, uh, you know, it, it's and I want it to be with box and papers um, and I want it to be unpolished. And so like as these sorts of conditions, you add them on, you may find that you have to be patient and sit around for a while before one of these becomes available. So this very much is trending more towards the experience of owning and buying and collecting watches that you would generally more commonly associate with with vintage watches, even though these are really neo neo vintage. So it's yeah, it's just really about what sort of experience you're after. But then I think um, sort of almost in opposition to the idea of the best value for money reference or variation of this watch that that we could pick is to ask the question, what would we pick if money was no object? In other words, if some sort of subjective best version of the GMT master is what you were after, um, how would you decide what that is? And then based on that criteria, what would you pick? And so for me, I think I would pick the 116719 BLRO. Um, and I'll kind of go into my reasons for why I I would pick this. But um, let's talk about the watch itself first. It's in white gold. It is the first one, uh, the first GMT Master done in white gold. And there are two versions of this watch. One has a black dial and then one has the blue dial. But here I'm talking specifically about the black dial. It was produced from 2014 to 2018, so there's no current retail price, but the current market price is $38,700 with um, you know, a little bit of a decline over the last year, but the long-term um, value uh, retention story for this watch is a positive one when we look back over the last five years. And it's sort of, you know, it's trading at a little bit of a discount from uh, the current retail price for the comparable in production uh, precious metal Rolex reference. So from from that perspective as well, it's it's done a, it's doing a very remarkable job of sort of, you know, holding a steady value. But, you know, what's going on with a watch itself and why why would I pick this? Well, if I am going to pick the design variation that best epitomizes the GMT Master, then I think it has to be the one that is most closely associated with the tool watch um, heritage of the watch. You know, th this is a watch that was at one point not a luxury watch, but it was it was meant to be a watch that was worn by people who wore it for a specific purpose um, associated primarily with, um, you know, aer aeronautical applications. But th this was not a watch that you wore because you thought um, it looked pretty on your wrist and you wanted to sort of, you know, send some sort of social signal about how much wealth you have or the kinds of things that you value. Uh, it was It was more about this is something I need to do a job and how well does it do that job? And so that tool watch really has always been in stainless steel with the bicolor blue and red bezel with a black dial. And this watch essentially exactly matches that visual description. Now, the thing of course that it does not match that watch on is the fact that it's made out of precious metal and not um, stainless steel. And um, the reason that I prefer that is because it is no longer a tool watch. It is, in fact, a luxury watch. Um, and so for that sort of uh, side of the equation to be, uh, 
you know, sort of marked as, as as checked. I think the watch does have to be in precious metal, which of course, you know, also goes with the tradition of fine watchmaking being done in uh, precious or noble metals. So here in that instance, that is white gold, which lets it look the part for most people who will not know any better, just like a standard tool watch. But for the few people who can, um, at a glance, tell the difference between white gold and steel, uh, and certainly, you know, for yourself, based on the weight really of the watch on the wrist, because it's going to be so much heavier, you'll know you have something that is uh, truly and incredibly uh, special. And if you wanted to buy one right now, there's a listing from Watchbox on eBay for 39,450. Um, this watch, of course, like I said, is available with a, a blue dial as well, uh, both in the 116719 and in the 126719. But at that point, you're really just announcing that what you have is white gold, um, more so than expressing a preference, I think, for the blue dial. But, you know, that's just sort of my take on it. Do you have a horse in this race? Do you sort of care about what you want your GMT master or your, sorry, your GMT or your travel watch to look like and what the ideal sort of implementation of that watch looks like? And does, does that ideal version exist? Uh, which GMG Master is for you. Let us know in the comments below and we'll catch you in the next video on Tuesday and then again on Friday. Thanks for listening.